kind of touching on that of how many athletes do you get every year that really struggle with basic throwing? How many guys, on, I mean, every state's different, but I, you know, statistical averages are statistical averages. I would assume, I mean, every year I get, when I think I had a kid that I'm, I'm not going to see possibly a kid that doesn't have some, I get somebody who shows up and it's like, okay, I, I, this is like a total, total project, right? Um, <clears throat> so the biggest thing that you're seeing now is what all of your, that your technology is influencing <clears throat> everything you're trying to do. So what do, you, what, do, what do all of your athletes pretty much have and what do they do all day? They're texting and they're on their phones, they're on their computers. And so this is where you look at, um, you know, just the head angle. You notice that last, that last frame, <clears throat> 60 degrees makes the head weigh about 60 pounds. And you see this, and so when you see, look at this, this little infograph, right? They're playing video games, there's eye strain, there's this, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things now, like uh, we're talking Facebook depression. I mean, um, people are playing, the kids are playing games. Guys play more games than girls, uh, for sure. Um, but they're downloading their instant messaging, right? So they're just spending all of this time. And um, so this kind of gives you an example of some of the, kind of some of the postures you see, these are clearly exaggerated, but the, obviously the last one is the aligned posture. Cervical spine alignment automatically increases strength. And so <clears throat> when you have all your kids doing this, if you're not doing stuff in your strength training program or you're not recognizing that this can have an actual effect on what you're doing, then, then it is a little piece of something that you're missing and it can definitely make a big difference for you. Um, so like I said, if technique, <clears throat> It, technique is easier if the body's moving correctly. Um, so it, again, it's like I said, that overlooked variable. And again, additional variables, right, is when you, you have a beginner and intermediate, if, you've, if you guys come into a program and there's already kids been throwing or kids have come from a youth program and they have experience or they have never touched a discus or a shot put. And then when they haven't ever touched a discus or a shot put and they already have this forward head and they have medially rotated shoulders, abducted scaps, and they try to hold a shot put, and this is where you see the crease of the elbow up, and then no matter what you do, you can't get that kid to keep the elbow up, and this, and so if you're not addressing things in the weight room or some simple exercises to help fix that stuff, you're just going to be beating your brains out. So, and everybody I'm sure can relate, everybody does that, I mean, I don't think there's a kid at any point of any season every single year that I don't have that happen with. Um, so, like you said, it really starts to affect when you start to look at the posture. Well, we're always laying out drills and we're laying out progressions and we're laying out training plans. And then we have to look at how we're gonna execute those plans and how you're gonna group your athletes and how your general strength training programs are gonna go. Um, this starts to become a super big influence and I'll talk about some of that here in a sec so here's a perfect example here's a kid um, and she's learning some stuff <clears throat> from my system she was an athlete that was didn't live near me she actually lived a couple hundred miles away and would come train like once a month uh, come to coordinate seeing some family with her family but if you notice her standing there on the left one of the things you see is that kind of the you know the forward shoulders and she's got what we refer to right as a little bit of abduction of the scapulas they're kind of coming out and the key is, is if you look at your athletes and you see their hands when they stand and you can see the back of their hand instead of their palm facing their thighs that means the external rotators are weak and usually the scap retractors are weak so now their orbits on their rotational throws is going to be usually pretty much messed up so and we watch her throw, so watch the finish, and then you see how it's like super disconnected. So if we just show something, and I'll talk about this, and this is kind of part of our system, but she winds up, and this is part of what we teach. We're, our pillar one is all about the start of the throw, and uh, so I'm setting her in a better position so she can move better. This is actually a big improvement from where she was. Um, <clears throat> and so when she goes right here, if, if you look, the orbit's already off on the shoulders and she's going to start bringing the shoulder forward. So this, this position here, this is uh, what you're going to see when you see the kids with this type of an issue, on, especially on rotational throws, they can't create stretch reflex and separation correctly. So if you can't separate, you don't create stretch reflex and then everything's going to be 
very disconnected, and it's going to be a much longer learning curve. <clears throat> so what we'll do is this is how we just kind of giving an example of, of how we're thinking about strength. The first things we're thinking about is kinetic chain reaction, right? We want to look at the individual needs and how the body's laid out, so how the, how the gross posture imbalances are going to be affecting the throwers, and, and they're basically... Um, like I said, we'll, we talk something also, we call it the feedback mechanism. <clears throat> and the more, um, the more you're moving in the right positions, the, the better an athlete feels the throw. And this is why you get kids who absolutely right, can't feel the throw whatsoever. And I don't know how many of you guys, how many of you guys ask that question? You know, I'm, I'm very much, what did that feel like? You guys, I'm sure a lot of you guys do that, right? So how many of you guys have athletes that go, uh, when you say, can you feel that? That was a better throw. That was different than the other one. Can you feel the difference? And they say, no. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, so that's what we're talking about. And so some of the reason they can't, it's legit because their body's out of position and they, it all feels generally the same. <clears throat> so so when, this, when the posture is out of, out of position, the central nervous system patterns, right, don't learn quickly and they don't feel correctly. So the whole thing is we refer to it in our system as GPR, gro gross posture rebalancing. It's a real, it's just a simple coin so we could distinguish exercises with a specific goal of we need most, more posterior work, right, more hamstring work, um, more scap work, more... Um, you know, and, and core work, and, and again, I'll, I'll mention in a second. So we do integrated mobility with that. So foam rolling, everybody foam rolls now. I remember, I've been in this, doing this kind of stuff long enough, I remember when nobody knew what a foam roller really was, and now, you know, every gym in, in across the country has a foam roller, or uses a med ball or a lacrosse ball or something. So we add, add some of that to help facilitate improving some of these patterns in the weight room. So, of course, then we're going to focus, then you can more effectively focus on multi-joint sequential strength movements. Olympic lifts, I think, are absolutely fantastic for that. Um, uh, and again, some of your sports-specific work, and then, again, we've referred to as uh, central nervous system throwing dominant work versus lifting dominant. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of a thrower here in a second. Um, so this kid, here's a perfect example so the kid on the on the right and him were training partners last year these are a couple of my Arizona kids the kid on the right is at Colorado State and the kid on the left you will watch him move now this kid had a came into me strong and this is a, this is the other example where he's a pretty strong kid but he has medially ro medial rotated shoulders and he'll have an anterior pelvic tilt so that means his quads and his hips are really tight, hammies are a little weak, right? The, the quad to strength ratio or quad to hamstring ratio is out of balance. So just a simple exercise, and I'm sure you guys have probably done some of this, so we're just doing some overhead squats to work on range of motion. And here's this kid when he first started, okay? So literally, we're just talking the bar. This is the type of thing. This is gonna affect his movement in the ring. And I'm sure every one of you has some kid who's strong as an ox, or a girl who's super strong and she they can't just move real well. So here was just some different things that we wind up doing to um, work on ankle mobility and different things like that, um, which has an impact on it. But that kid, um, he basically started out, he had a 325 bench as a junior and like a 400 pound squat and he could only snatch basically 100 pounds, it was really ugly and he could snatch and he could clean maybe 170. So clearly really strong kid, but out of position. So the first thing we focused on him was this. He was a 40, he had 46 feet once and 130 once. And um, he threw 170 and 57 feet the next season. So he went from, you know, nobody knew who this kid was. He's at middle of the pack, you know, another 40 something footer decent throw but nothing that's going to get you anywhere and this kid's going he gray shirted to train with me and he's going to Louisiana Tech on a, on a throwing scholarship this next year so he's also a good student so they like that um, <clears throat> so quick story again when I was I spent a bunch of years as a personal trainer it's funny I had a business here in Chicago and we were really successful and I started to see the influences of technology, right? People come in, and it was pretty much 28 to 55. They, they're less active. They're working. They're focusing on making money. And um, so what, what you would see is all the issues related to that. 
So we fixed it, <clears throat> restored posture, aches, pains, you know, went away. People feel fantastic. So back in the day, so back in the day, we coined it tech posture. And so <clears throat> this was like the mid 2000s. And now they literally have the stuff that you're seeing with teenagers, they call it tech's neck. It's like a real thing now. So like literally all these kids just sit here like this all day. So it's, so what I used to see, the point of that was that I used to just see this with like professionals and you know, people that were spending you know, copious times building their careers. And that's why they would come to a personal trainer because they let themselves kind of get out of shape. And now they had money to go hire somebody like me to get them in shape. And so you know, now we're seeing it with 15 year olds and 16 year olds and 17 year olds, right? So we're seeing it and we're even, I'm even seeing it with some of the youth kids that I've, that I coached. So it, you know, so it's, um, but they're like, you know, young kids are like new tires. You can, you could burn out and, you know, slam the brakes on and it, everything seems to be okay. But, you know, 10,000 miles into the tires, they're going to be worthless. And so we'll see where all these guys are when they're in their twenties. Um, so, <clears throat> so here's this kid when he first started again, you can kind of see if this picture, this kid is like grimacing. So this is the mobility stuff that we do, how we, we target with the foam rolling to open up, right? And it, that's what the whole point of a foam roller is. If you guys kind of, the science is Golgi tendon organ relaxes, uh, it's a receptor that makes the muscle actually lengthen. That's how it should be used. Short, quick bouts work really effectively. And we kind of integrate it in while they're weight training so that we can improve the range of motion while they're doing a squat or an overhead squat or a snatch or something to that effect. So again, this is kind of what you'll see. This kid had just, and when, I told, when he went from 46 to 57, um, actually he went from 45 to 57, <clears throat> that was him, he, had, he was a first year spinner. So, um, and I think he, as a, as a you know, gray shirt this year, he'll probably throw 55 to 56 feet with the 16. So pretty, pretty good conversion. Um, he was one of those kids that warmed up at 60 feet, like, you know, in five meets. It was like, it's finally going to be here, you know, and he, he always would just 57 feet. Um, so at any rate, um, so the technology is, is affecting the coaching outcome, and that's kind of, um, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are, how many of you guys are noticing that, but it's, it's, it's legit. And again, some of the things that you want to focus on, it's, it's not real complicated on how to pretty significant improvement, which is going to improve their ability to move. So, um, if, if you don't address it, obviously you get, you just get less. I think it's real easy to pick up two, three feet, you know, 10 to 15 feet in the discus from simply just having some of those improvements in the posture. Like I said, I used that kid, Tim, you know, improved 30, 30 plus feet, <clears throat> just over 30 feet in the discus and uh, actually 35 feet in the discus and, you know, 12 feet in the shot. So where I call it is I uh, kind of correlate it with the four degrees of posture and athletic ability. So when you're looking at your, your exceptionally talented kids, they're typically less out of balance. Right? They, they, just, they just look the part. They come in, they're bigger, not necessarily have perfect postures, but overall they're <clears throat> much more balanced. They pass the eyeball test, right? Everybody's had that athlete, oh, look, yes, look who's coming in to, to train. Um, and then you have your good kids, and your good kids with talent and potential, those are the kids. I kind of considered myself one of those kids. I was a good kid with talent, uh, but I was like a string bean. And, uh, but I could, you know, feel some things. So I didn't have a lot of deviations. I had no weight training whatsoever. And then, you know, so those are the kids that you can really turn into some exceptional kids. And I have a number of those kids that have gone on, you know, college scholarships as well. Um, and then again, your average kids, the kids you see with multiple deviations, right? That's where you're starting to see like that girl I showed you. She actually was pretty strong and could move. But she, she I was like, every time she'd see me, I was like, God, I, it's just so hard to teach somebody how to lift or tell them what to do and then they, they, they don't do it right and they're not getting the right result out of it as well. And then again, you get the kids that are just, you know, really struggle and have a hard time and those are going to be the kids that you're going to see a lot of these influences of their gaming and texting and they're, they're physically just deconditioned and their posture is kind of a reflection of that. And the more you can obviously fix that, the better they can get. Um, so. When we look at this, these are the kind of the most common things, which I'll call as the abducted scaps, 
with the varying degree of medial rotation. And when you took, look at the, um, the internal rotators are strong, so that's going to be, you know, you're going to see the teres major and, and the serratus, and you're going to see the pecs. And so you see a lot of, you know, guys especially, right? Not, I don't think anybody in this room has, has young teenage throwers that just absolutely want to go bench all the time. And so that, combined with not enough posterior chain work and then their video gaming and all that kind of stuff, you have to start countering that. So the reason this stuff is kind of a big deal, and here I'll go through the kind of the main posture points. So this is what I call mild kyphosis and lordosis, right, a kyphotic lordotic posture. Um, <clears throat> and that's where you're just going to see athletes kind of standing like that, and they, get a little, they can get a little more like into this position. And that's where we call the anterior pelvic tilt. So you're looking at the hips rotating down, the, the hamstrings basically get elongated. So a lot of times they'll, they'll go to their trainers at the school and the trainers will say, oh, look, you have tight hamstrings. Well, it's like if I stretch the rubber band, the rubber band's going to be tight. So when they lay down and they do the hamstring test, their pelvis is out of alignment and it's like, oh, look at how tight you are. So if they go to a neutral spine, you're going to see the degrees of range of motion improve. So that's some of the stuff. So it's really about strengthening the hamstring and, and putting the hamstring back into a better position. You start to neutralize the pelvis a little bit. Um, so the hyperextended knees, that's so kind of showed that picture. When you see your kids that stand around and they just, you know, they're just, they're standing like this and they're like this, you know, those are the kids that you're, you're seeing all these things. That's all going to impact what they're doing in the circle. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll just kind of verbally explain why in a second. And of course, ankle flexion. So when the legs hyperextend, ankles are flexed. <clears throat> and um, so the deal is now if I'm trying to be able to, you know, pivot or I'm going to be trying to get everything pushed right and my ankles and my hips and everything don't move, the, basically think of this, the, um, the shoulders and the hips are basically a switch. Okay, so especially... I mean, for all the throws, there's a, there's a degree, there's separation required, right? So specifically, obviously, in the rotational throws, <clears throat> the more separation you can get in the power position, the better. And in the glide, you have to, you have to be able to set up efficient separation as well. Um, when the shoulders are uh, abducted, or if they're just abducted, you know, you've seen your kids that just kind of look like this, and then you see, you know, the immediately rotated kids or the, you know, the shoulders, you, the varying degrees... Once this and this are coordinated, these are the two switches for, for the core. So once these two are out of position, the core is done. Like they can't, they can't turn. So what you're going to see is uh, you're going to see kids, they, cannot, they, can't, they can't separate, and you're going to always see the, the, the improper wind up. You're going to see high and low point orbits are going to always be off, right? So when you see them in the power position, you're going to see the, um, usually you see this in the power position instead of this. So they can't, so immediately they're always going to be coming off their right foot into delivery, whether it's the glide or the rotational shot or the discus. Um, so this is really where you start to look at, so the core is basically active. So you can do core work until you're blue in the face, right? And that's why that kid Tim was a perfect example. This kid, <clears throat> he literally... Um, his parents punish him by taking away his weights. That's how much this kid loves to, to weight train. Like literally, you're grounded, you can't lift weights for the next month. And so, so he is a perfect example. Like he's strong as could be, but he was out of balance. So as we got him in balance, we started to really unlock what he could do and, and then having him work on those positions. And he'll always have a tendency to want to go to that because he likes to bench and he likes to squat heavy and he loves to eat seven times a day and you know all that kind of stuff so <clears throat> so at any rate that's really what your um, why the posture is so important and um, so basically you know we talk about it in kind of in our strength training system the STT that's our strength training for throwers um, we're looking at you know we're always focusing on all three planes of movement and the posture is going to really start to influence that so if you look at it throwing is the ultimate three plane type of movement you're how you're setting angles, rotating, dropping up, you're down, you're, you're, you know, you're going linear, you're going side to side, frontal sagittal and transverse. Um, so obviously when we talk about said principle, we're talking about, you know, obviously specific adaptation and post demands, right? That's just, so if the, as you start to do things to correct the posture, the point of that is what's the, what's the imposed demand? Texting and playing on games. 
So if you guys don't have uh, some simple things added into your training that are just going to start countering the fact that this is what they do every single day for several hours, you have to have a certain amount of time that's going to be spent start fixing some of these things.